Welcome back to Mind of Messiah Ministries. This is Sharon Cluck coming to you from Southern Missouri. I want to talk to you today about generational curses. Are they real? And do we need to know if we have generational curses to operate in the courts of heaven? Because we've been talking about the courts of heaven recently. So before I get started, I'm going to ask you to please give us a like, give us a thumbs up. Please share this with others that may have some questions about this topic. Subscribe. I'd appreciate that if you would subscribe. And please leave your comments below, down below, because I want to know what you're thinking. I want to know what you know about generational curses that I don't. Also, would you please finish this because it's not really very long, but if you get to the end, you'll see that we've made some conclusions, and I want to know if you agree with those conclusions or not. Today, I want to get into a subject that's quite controversial, generational curses. I want to know if you think they're real or not. So we're going to look at the scriptures to see what they say. Do they apply to a born-again, regenerated believer that's sold out to Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah? We've been considering the courts of heaven for several weeks now. And if you haven't seen those teachings on this channel, there's a teaching called Dealing with Satan, the Accuser. And there's another one called Judgments from Heaven. You're going to want to go back and look at those to get some background understanding. So when you finish listening today, go back and review those two teachings, and I'll put those links in the description. Much of this teachings on the courts of heaven address generational curses, are the sins of our ancestors. And even Derek Prince, whom I have had a great respect for over the years, he teaches on curses. And when he does that, he says you have to go back to the source of the curse. Well, we all know that that's not always possible. If it were, we could maybe address that, but we don't always have that information. So the question today is, are generational curses real, and do they apply to born-again Christians? The answer is that yes, there are curses, they do exist, there are generational curses that exist. That part is clear in the word. The second question is not near as clear, and we're going to see that through the scriptures. Can they have influence over a truly born-again Christian? So there's many scriptures that relate to the concept of generational curses, but we're only going to look at a few of them. We don't have time to go over them all. The original source on generational curses comes from the giving of the commandments to Moses. And this is when God is telling Israel that they're not to have any other gods at all. And we read that in Exodus 20, verse 5. You shall not worship them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God, demanding what is rightfully and uniquely mine visiting and avenging the iniquities or the sin guilt of the fathers on the children that is calling the children to account for the sins of their fathers to the third and to the fourth generations of those who hate me so i want to take a close look at the word hate me that in the hebrew in the strong's concordance is h81 30. It is swane, S-A-W-N-A-Y, swane. It means to hate personally. It's an enemy or a foe, to utterly hate. So God's talking about, when he's talking about generational curses, he's talking about people who actually hate him. These are the enemies of God. They're not people who just don't know about God. There are people who are enemies of God, people that are working for the kingdom of darkness. In Exodus 20, verse 6, it says, But showing graciousness and steadfast loving kindness to thousands of generations of those that love me and to keep my commandments. So when we look at this, the curses are affecting three or four generations. 
and the blessings pass to a thousand generations. This same scripture is repeated again in Exodus 34. So let's take a look at that. Keeping mercy and loving kindness for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting and avenging the iniquity, the sin guilt of the fathers upon the children and the grandchildren to the third and the fourth generation. That is calling the children to account for the sins of their fathers. So those scriptures plainly say the children can be held accountable for the sins of their fathers. And then in Lamentations 5, 7, it says, Our fathers sin, and they are no more. But it's us who have carried their sin. So he's lamenting over the fact that even though their fathers are dead, they're still having to deal with the sins of their fathers. That doesn't hardly sound fair. Well, let's look further and see what God says. In these scriptures, it appears that curses are passed to the fallen generations. And again, the question is, does this apply to those who are born again? Those of us who come under the new covenant, under the assurance of the salvation in the blood of Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua. There are other scriptures that appear to contradict what these verses are saying. Since the word of God does not contradict itself, there has to be an explanation. So let's look at a few of these other scriptures that seem to be contradictions. The whole chapter of Ezekiel 18 should be read in context because God goes through three generations to make his point completely clear. I really don't like to do topical teachings that much because I really like to read within context, but you can't do that in 30 minutes. So I'm going to start in Ezekiel 18, and we're going to go from 20 to 24. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of his father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of his son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Well, that doesn't line up with what we just read. Verse 21, but if the wicked will turn from all of his sin, that sounds like repentance, that he hath committed, and keep all of my statutes, so he has to turn away from sin, and then he has to keep the commandments of God, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Verse 22, all of his transgressions that he committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. That sounds like to me what Jesus said, that he was going to take our sins and throw them as far from the east as from the west, that they would be in the sea of forgetfulness. So he says in his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. So when he repents, he's going to live in righteousness. Well, let's look on the other side, the flip side of this. 23. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord, and not that he should return from his ways and live? But when the righteous turns away from his righteousness, and that does happen sometimes, and he commits iniquity, and he does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, so if he gets if he claims to be living for God, and then he turns and he gets involved with, and we see that people get with the wrong crowd. They claim that they've had a, a conversion, that they believe in Jesus Christ, or baptized in the Holy Spirit. I mean, they've had, they've tasted of the good things of God, and yet they will get involved with the things of the world, and they will forget the things of God and move into unrighteousness. Well, this is what it's saying in Ezekiel happens to this person. It says, but when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doth according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All his righteousness that he's done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he's trespassed and in his sin that he's sinned. And them 
he'll die. If those are the way that he ends his life is in sin and iniquity, that's what he'll be held accountable for. All the good that he did before will not be held accountable to him. I remember, I remember when my son was a teenager and I corrected him about something. He said, well, what about all this that I did good? And what about all that? And I said to him, son, what you don't know is if you live your whole life a righteous life and then you get in trouble and you decide that it's time to rob a bank. When you stand before the judge, he's not going to say, well, Jeff, tell me all the good stuff that you did before you robbed this bank. You're going to be held accountable for the last thing that you did. And my husband always says, it's not the way the party begins. It's the way the party ends that everybody remembers. It's the same way with your life. It's the way that it ends. And true, people do remember your past more than God does. God doesn't remember it. People will remind you. So these verses are clear that each person answers for his own disobedience. So let's see what Jeremiah says. Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. That's what God does. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his way and according to the fruit of his doings. So in Jeremiah 17, there's nothing here about receiving a reward or even a consequence because of someone else's work. So then turning to the New Testament, let's see what it says. Galatians 3.17, this is the CJB, the Complete Jewish Bible. The Messiah redeemed us from the curse pronounced in the Torah or in the law that he gave to Moses. By becoming accursed on our behalf. For the Tanakh or the, the prophets have said, everyone who hangs from a stake comes under a curse. Verse 14, Yeshua the Messiah, he did this so that in union with him, we become in union with him, that the Gentiles might receive the blessing announced to Abraham. So Jesus becomes cursed so you can become blessed. This is the great exchange. This is how much he loves us. He takes on your curse and he dies for your sin. And instead he gives you his blessing that he lived from living a sinless life. From taking your transgressions. So that through trusting and being faithful. Two things. We trust and we continue to be faithful we might receive what was promised, namely the Spirit. So what was promised to the believers was the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is ascended into heaven, and when the fullness comes of Shavuot and the Spirit is given, it's like the presence of Jesus, Yeshua himself, returning to the believers, and now he's going to live within them. So he's already returned to us. He lives in us. He dwells in us. I'm not saying there's not a second coming. I, I know there is, according to the word. But there is a return of his spirit already, and it's living in you. And most of us don't have a great appreciation for the power of the fact that Christ is living in you. The word redeemed is from... Uh, in the Strong's Concordance from the Greek is 1537. It means to buy up. That is to ransom or to rescue us. So the loss that we were going to experience for our sin, he's rescued us from that. So notice that it says trusting and being faithful. We receive the promise of Abraham. Man, when you look at those promises, you look at Deuteronomy 28, those are some incredible promises. Blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed in your, your baskets, blessed coming in, blessed going out. You're blessed in your livestock and your children and your offspring. Everything about you is blessed when you receive the promise of Abraham. When you receive that because you have come into the family of God through the blood of Yeshua. It says the curse that Jesus, Yeshua, took for us was the great exchange. He bore our curses. We received his blessings. It is the greatest love story ever told. In the past, I have fully embraced 
the teaching on generational curses. I've prayed with many people to break the curses that came from vows made by their forefathers involving other gods. When they made vows and promises and swore by other gods, I have helped people pray through these things and to renounce them. We recognize them, we repent from them, we renounce them. In reality, you and I, all of us, have made vows and we don't even realize we've done it. We say things like, I'll never do that again. Or, I'm, I'm never going to be like my mother. I will never give a person, that person, another chance. Do me once, shame on me. Do me twice, sh sh vice versa. Do me, do me once, shame on you. Do me twice, shame on me. My dad used to say that all the time. We've all made vows of one kind or another, and we fail to weigh the strength of our own words and what we might have set in motion when we spoke them. So recently, in searching the Word of God, I'm seeing generational curses in a different light. Believe me, I didn't want to do this teaching. The Holy Spirit kept dealing with me on this, and it's taken me 10 days to post again because I didn't want to do this. I kept going back and saying, okay, I see it, Lord, I see it. And he kept saying to me, Sharon, you got to make this clear. We don't blame everything that happens to us in our life on our ancestry, on our bloodline, and on the devil. So let me go further, and I'll explain why. I find myself asking, are some of these things that we call generational curses are they actually woundings that a person has suffered at the hand of others? Are we spiritually dealing with a curse passed down through the bloodline? Or are we healing wounds and hurts that occurred within the client's life? Many of our forefathers have made vows related to their children, especially those in secret societies and occult religions. So we question, when the child is born again, do those curses and vows that their parents took concerning them lose their power? Well, I think this is a shade of gray, and I'm going to share a scripture that will make you see why I'm saying that. Before that, let me ask another question. Can a child, a baby, an unborn child, feel rejection in the womb? Well, the answer is yes. I've seen it many times. Is that a generational curse? Or is it a wound? I'm a trained inner healing counselor. That's why some of this is really important to me. And often in counseling, we uncover sins of ancestors as clients go through healing. Bondages are broken and people get set free from things that have tormented them all of their lives. In last week's teaching on binding the strong man, I shared scriptures that showed that the power of a person's sin is what will keep them in bondage. Iniquity, sin, is a force. It's the food, the substance, the nourishment of Satan. It's what he thrives on. The more iniquity that is exposed in the earth, the more power he displays. So the more that we see mankind move in a sinful way, the more power Satan begins to demonstrate or display. I spoke of our repenting for the sin of others for the purpose of binding the strong man in their life. That the power of their sin was Satan's legal claim to keep them in bondage. I gave the scriptures related to that concept in that teaching. If you'd like to go back and see that again, I'll put that below. I'll put a link below. If you and I are walking in daily righteousness with Yeshua Jesus, you've already repented for your own sin. However, that's not always the case. Just because we see a need for Jesus in our life and we repent from our sins overall, there may be specific things in our life 
that we're not dealing with. Even those claiming to follow Jesus, Yeshua, still dabble in sin. And that's why it's so extremely important for a new believer to begin to renew their mind with the Word of God and to continue to do that every single day. I can tell you from experience, it takes a lifetime for everything that we learned in the world to fully come under the submission, under the authority of the Word of God. And without renewing our minds, we will continue to walk in what we have been taught by the systems of this world. And the ruler of this world will use that against you. We see that plainly in these next scriptures. And I wanted to back this up by scripture. I don't want to just pull an idea out of the hat. I want you to see this plainly in the word. This is out of Acts 19, starts in 11. And I'm going to use the Passion Translation. God kept releasing a flow of extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul. Because of this, people took Paul's handkerchiefs and articles of clothing and even pieces of cloth that had touched his skin, laying them on the bodies of the sick and the diseased, and demons left them. And they were healed. When the demons left, the healing came. Much of sickness is related to demonic oppression, according to the Word of God. Verse 13. Now, there were seven itinerant Jewish exorcists. These are the sons of Sceva, the high priest. So these young men are in line to be in office as priest who took it upon themselves to use the name and the authority of Jesus over those who were demonized. So obviously, these people are accustomed to recognizing that there are demons, and the people get demon-possessed. It wasn't out of the ordinary for them. We look at demon-possessed people today, and we call it anything but that. We label it mental illness or schizophrenia or all kinds of things that whatever the medical field wants to put a label on it and give them a pill for is what we call it. The people at the time of Yeshua recognized demon possession when they saw it, even when they didn't have the authority and know Jesus well enough to actually cast them out. They still tried to do that. So it says they took it upon themselves to use the name and the authority of Jesus over those who were demonized. And they would say, we cast you out in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. So these seven young men did not make a commitment to Jesus. They were just using the name that Paul uses. Verse 15, one day when they said those words, the demon in the man replied, I know about Jesus and I recognize Paul. Who do you think you are? Verse 16. And then the demonized man jumped on them and he threw them to the ground, beating them mercilessly. He overpowered the seven exorcists until they all ran out of the house naked and badly bruised. So he rips all their clothes off of them. And that's one man against seven. Verse 17. All the people in Ephesus, so this is happening in Ephesus, were awestruck. Both the Jews and the non-Jews, when they heard about what happened, great fear fell over the entire city. And the authority of the name of Jesus, Yeshua, was exalted. Verse 18, many believers, I want to say that again, many believers publicly confessed their sins and disclosed their secrets. Large numbers of those who had been practicing magic, what? Believers in Yeshua were practicing magic? They took all of their books and their scrolls and their spells, spells and incantations, incantations, and publicly burned them. And when the value of all the books and the scrolls was calculated, it came to several million dollars. 
millions of dollars spent on occult practices. And these are born again, spirit filled believers. These were believers. The narrative before this tells us that these were baptized spirit filled believers in Yeshua that were still participating in occult practices. Is that happening today? Heaven forbid. Let me ask you a question. Did these believers who professed faith in Yeshua, but still practiced in the occult, did they have full protection from demonic activity in their lives? You answer. Is it possible that they could have brought a curse upon themselves while practicing spells and incantations that they're putting on other people? Are, are summonsing up demons themselves? Are, are trying to produce prosperity for themselves or whatever they were doing incantations for? If they learned these practices from their parents, well, is that a generational curse? Or is that a consequence of their own sin? Lots of questions today. The controversy over a generational curse comes from those who believe that once a person is born again, that nothing from the past has any influence over them. After all, they are a new creation in Christ Jesus, according to 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Here's the key. If any man be in, I in Christ. So in the Greek, that is number 1722 in the Strong's Concordance. It means a fixed position. He's not moving. A place in time, a state. It means a place of rest. So Paul, and Ephesians 2 says that we're seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. So does that apply to everyone that has said the sinner's prayer? Do you think people that are still dabbling in the occult and doing incantations and dealing with occult paraphernalia, do you think that they're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus? Is this a spiritual position that we all have? Or are there conditions to being able to be in the presence of God? There's no doubt that when someone vows to follow Jesus with all of their heart, soul, and mind, that something supernatural happens to that person. But not everyone who recites the sinner's prayer is truly that committed. So for those people that are not fully in, though many believe that they are, so why would Jesus talk about being hot or cold and not being a fence sitter? Somebody is not fully in, and they may think they are. So how strongly are they influenced by the power of their upbringing? If I had a dollar for every time my husband said, well, that's the way I was raised. I'd be wealthy. Just because that's the way you were raised doesn't make it right or righteous. If the way you were raised doesn't line up with God's word, then that part of your life needs to lose its influence over you. So that brings us back to the courtroom of heaven. If you have any understanding of the word of God, you comprehend that through Adam's sin, that sin entered into the world and it came in through Adam. Because of that, there's an original sin nature that is passed to every one of us. You, you and I, we have a sin nature. Romans 5.18 says this. In other words, just as condemnation came upon all people through one transgression, so through one righteous act of Jesus' sacrifice, the perfect righteousness that makes us right with God and leads us to a victorious life is now available to all. It doesn't say all have it 
are all have obtained it. It says it's now available to us all. Verse 19, Romans 5, verse 19. One man's disobedience opened the door for all humanity to become sinners. Adam. So one man's obedience opened the door for many to be made perfect, perfectly right with God and acceptable to him. So there's evidence in the scripture of righteous men repenting for the sins of not only their ancestors, but for the sins of whole nations. And Daniel is a perfect example. And even Isaiah did this. They both saw that being in the midst of ungodly people caused them to be unclean themselves. And that required their repentance on their own behalf, as well as on behalf of their forefathers. For Israel, they had a written record of the sin of their ancestors. Some of us don't even know who our parents are. That's the kind of world we live in. That's a major problem with us, needing to repent for the sins of our forefathers. There is no way in the world that we can possibly know every vow, every idolatry, every oath taken by our ancestors. If the Spirit of God doesn't reveal that to us, we can't know what kind of deals were made with the devil within our bloodline. Listen, I could go to my own bloodline and tell you that I had ancestors that held seances and called up the dead. When I got born again, I renounced those things. I repented for my ancestors. Did I need to? Well, I'm glad that I did, because I didn't want any part of that in my life. When we look at scriptures, it's clear that there is such a thing as a generational curse. It appears to be upon those enemies of God and the consequences of hating God and disobedience, following generations that have been taught to continue in that sin will experience the curse of that sin. Listen, curses come through disobedience. It's clearly, read the chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, and it will tell you, we can have the blessings, it's our choice, or we can have the curses, it's our choice. They come from disobedience. Blessings come from obedience. Curses come from disobedience. So, where do they come from? Well, do they come from the devil? Do they come from God? Do they come through the sins of our ancestors? Or do they come through our own actions? Proverbs 26, 2 tells us, The curse causeless shall not come. So if there is a curse in your life or in your lineage, there's a cause for it, a reason for it. The scripture tells us we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. We see those curses listed in Deuteronomy 28. Every one of them comes from disobedience. Just like the believers in Ephesus, we can open ourselves up to attacks from the enemy. When we choose to obey God, he becomes our master. And Jesus told us that we can't serve two masters. He told us in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you're going to hate one and love the other, or you're going to be devoted to one and you're going to despise the other one. You can't serve both, both God and money. Well, the word money in the Greek is 3126. That word means something that is deified something that you worship, something that you hold in high esteem and you love it, like we're supposed to worship God. Romans 6.16 6, says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether, you, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. The courts of heaven are established and even within the pages of the scriptures we see them. I personally have applied the teachings of the courts of heaven and I've seen amazing results.
someday I'll get to share that with you. What I've shared in other teachings is that I believe it's another tool in our warfare arsenal, and it should be used when we're led to do so by the Spirit of God. It's not a formula. It's our privilege and our honor through the blood of Yeshua to approach the throne of God, or as others see it, the desk of the supreme judge of the universe in the courts of heaven. The person who commits to follow Jesus has a repentant heart. He has seen that he has a sin nature and that he needs a savior. People who have not repented from sin, who remain in their rebellion, will possibly fall under a generational curse. The enemy will be able to use the power of their sins and that of their ancestors as legal authority to interfere in their lives. Again, there are many more scriptures related to this topic that we could explore, but what I believe I've seen that for me in the future, when I lead someone to receive Yeshua as Lord and Master, I'm going to ask them then and there to not only say that they're sorry and repent for their own sins, but to repent for the sins of their forefathers as well. With that done and a heart to walk in righteousness, the power of any curse should be broken from the past and they should truly be a new creation in Christ Jesus. So one more thing. Someone told me last week that what God has blessed, no one can curse. Well, that's what God said about Israel in Numbers 22 when Balaam was hired to curse Israel. That was true. As long as Israel was obedient to God, when they moved into idolatry and fornication, they were easily cursed. They cursed themselves through acts of disobedience. And that's why even in the book of Revelations, we see the churches in Asia Minor still had the doctrines of Balaam. Revelations 2.14, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrines of Balaam, who taught Balak. So now we know what happened. Balaam couldn't curse Israel, so he told Balak how to compromise them. He taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. So now you know that even though Balaam was not able to curse Israel in their righteousness, he told Balak how to curse them through temptation and sexual immorality. As long as they walked in righteousness, they could not be cursed. That's the same thing for you. If you follow this story in Numbers, you see how the children of Israel were tempted. And the reason that they ate things offered to idols was because they participated in the orgies and the worship of other gods. The food that was offered at the feast had already first been offered to Chemish. The reason they ate the things offered to idols is because they participated in the orgies and the worship of other gods with the Moabites. The food offered in these feasts had been first offered to Chemish, their god. This is a god where you, you heat up the, the arms of the god and you put the little baby in it and it burns it up. So where do curses come from? Disobedience. Just like it tells us in Deuteronomy 28. This chapter makes it clear that blessings come through obedience to God. And curses come through disobedience. One of the last things Moses said in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. When you choose life, you choose blessing. That both you and your seed may live. Yes, there is such a thing as generational curses. If you're a child of God and continue to walk in his righteousness, the curse causeless shall not come. If you're like the Ephesians and continue in sin, you will bear the consequences of your choices. 
If your family has dealt with a besetting sin for generations as new believers, you're going to need to take some steps to avoid that curse so that it doesn't have any power in your life. Satan uses sin to interfere in your life. Don't give him a reason to accuse you before the Father. And when I say that, I'm going to give you an example here. I have a dear friend who had alcoholism in the past generations for generations. As a very young man, even before he knew Christ, he made a decision that he would never ever touch an alcoholic beverage in his entire life. He's kept that personal vow and he will soon be 50 years old. He broke the power of that curse in his generations just by doing what was godly. So I'm going to ask you, leave me some comments below. Do you agree with what I've shared here? Are curses something that can come on a person that's accept the new birth through the blood of Jesus Christ? Or is that something that we bring on ourselves by our disobedience? Just give me a yes or a no in the comment section below. And tell me what you think. You don't have to leave anything else. You don't even have to identify yourself if you don't want to. But let me know where you stand on this. This was a hard teaching for me. I had to really ponder and ponder. And I felt like the Lord said people need to know that there are consequences for their actions. We cannot be blaming our ancestors or even the devil if we're going to open the door to them willingly ourselves. We have to pay the consequences. Our job is to be obedient and to walk in blessings. I thank you for watching. I ask you to like, to share this. Please subscribe. And I'll get back to you with any answers if you've asked me questions. God bless you and thank you. And I'll see you again next time.